Hello, my name is April Frederick and I'm a classical soprano based in the UK who does a lot of oratorio. And one of the pieces that I sing quite frequently is Handel's Messiah. Now, in Britain, a lot of people have grown up going to the Messiah, been to it since they were knee high to a hop toad, as we used to say back home. But I have two friends who are coming when I'm singing it tomorrow in Great Malvern Priory uh, with the English Symphony Orchestra who have never been. And as they, like I think a lot of people, didn't grow up in households where the Christian faith was something that was part of the fabric of life, or it's something they just remember from primary school or the long distant childhood, I sort of realized there would probably be a lot of concepts and a lot of terms that were used that were probably a bit foreign to them. So I thought I would come up with a sort of whistle-stop tour through this work to give a broad brush uh, of the historical context and of the structure and themes that run through the work and also to give some things to listen for in terms of the style. First, the historical context. So the name of the work, The Messiah, is actually the ancient title of the savior and king who was promised to the Jewish people and through the Jews to the world, who would reconcile humanity with God. And there were a bunch of prophecies that were given over about 4,000 years that gave progressive information about what this person would be like, uh, what kinds of things we could expect him to do when he came, even quite detailed information about where he'd be born and how he would die, as well as the fact that he would actually be the first to rise from the dead. Although, of course, they only worked this last bit out after the fact because it had never happened before. It's never happened since. So, why, you might say, do we need to be saved? It's a rather unusual, kind of unpopular concept these days. Well, let's begin at the very beginning with what you might have heard referred to as the fall. In the beginning of human history, the two kind of first forebears, Adam and Eve, are placed into this garden, given control over everything and said, you can have anything that you want, but God asks them to stay away from just one tree as a gesture of trust. Well, the serpent comes along and says, did God really say that you should eat of that tree? Do you know why? Because he knows that if you eat of it, you'll become like God's and you'll know the difference between good and evil. I'm sorry to say that Eve fell for it. So she ate of the apple, she gave it to Adam. I'm sorry to say Adam fell for it. And this is what I think of as the breaking of the world. Why is it such a big deal? Well, it was the very first fracturing of trust with God. Uh, and it's what you might have heard uh, referred to as sin. So in essence, it's basically a rebellion against God saying, I don't believe you, I'm taking back control, I want to be in control. It, it is the beginning of the fracturing of the relationship with God uh, between ourselves as creatures and also with the natural world. This is also the first moment when death enters into the experience of humanity. So the fall happens, it all breaks loose. Humanity has to leave the garden, but from that very time, God has this huge plan that he is wanting to put into motion that we're going to stretch over several thousand years to reconcile humanity to himself. And this kind of comes to its fulfillment in this person of the Messiah. So it's just this amazing tapestry of a story. The person who wrote the words for the Messiah kind of very much weaves together elements of the Old and New Testament to sort of show us progressively what this person's like and how these things are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. In terms of the rest of the Old Testament, the kind of build up to the actual appearance of the Messiah in history, just a few big signposts, if you will. And one of them is the character of Abraham. So he is a man who comes from quite an urban setting, probably in kind of ancient Persia, the city of Ur, and God calls him out and says, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this land and I'm gonna make you the father of a big nation and I'm going to bless all people through you. So this starts with kind of God's relationship with one person, then he sort of chooses this large nation, and then again, he, he keeps on kind of making agreements with individuals, and then expanding it out to the whole of history, and then that comes back into this one person, Messiah, and then back out to all humanity. So it's kind of very, very big movements here. And after Abraham you know, settles in the Promised Land, you know, um, modern day Israel, 
his, the people do become quite numerous, and then at one stage they go down to Egypt, uh, where they become even more numerous, but they actually get enslaved. So this is our next big episode, the character of Moses. So Moses was actually born into this enslaved people, and the theme of slavery, deliverance, is, is a big one that runs all throughout the Bible. Um, and Moses kind of actually ends up being raised up as a, as a leader to try and bring the Jewish people out from this slavery. And so there's that famous phrase, let my people go. So he goes to Pharaoh and says, you need to let us leave. And Pharaoh says, no. And so it's like this huge game of whales, it's such a big you know, game of um, imperial chicken uh, between the Pharaoh and you know, the God of the Israelites. And so the stakes get higher and higher and higher until finally um, God says, you know, you're so hard hearted, I'm actually going to kill the firstborn of all of the livestock and all of the families. And it's one of these episodes that's very hard to swallow, very hard to take and understand for us. But to the Israelites, he says, this is not gonna be the fate that befalls you. But in order for that to happen, I need you to kill a lamb and paint the blood over the doorpost. And then when the angel of death comes by, it will pass over your house. So this idea of a sacrificial lamb being the one who takes the punishment in essence and, and whose blood is the sign that averts judgment is one that sort of comes back and back and back, you know, all the way through through part two, is, you know, that focuses on, on Jesus' death and all the way kind of through into uh, the, the very last piece. Because the second bit that um, that Moses is kind of very, very wrapped up in is the giving of the law. So after the escape from Egypt, you know, the, the people end up in the wilderness and they're given uh, the law. And this is kind of God's blueprint for how we need to interact with him. So he is holy, he's righteous, there is going to be no sin in him, no darkness, nothing that is corrupt. And, you know, we would be kind of incinerated if we were near him. So he makes this whole kind of elaborate series of uh, of rules, if you will, of just the ways that his people should interact among themselves and with him. And part of the point of the law, I'm pretty convinced after kind of a lot of time thinking about it, is to show us that we can never get there. It is to sort of say that uh, we can never work hard enough to actually become holy, but it's actually just a reminder of the gap that always exists between what we are and what we should be. And the only person who kind of actually manages to bridge this gap in lived experience is, you got it, the Messiah. Then we fast forward quite a long way uh, to David. And David was one of the kings that uh, God chose to lead the people of Israel. He called him a man after his own heart. And uh, David wrote a lot of psalms, uh, sort of ancient sort of poetry, crying out to God. A lot of these are set uh, in, in Messiah, particularly Psalm 22, which referred to his own life, but also kind of looking forward to uh, the, the circumstances of Jesus' death in particular. Uh, it's very striking, the parallels there. But God promised to David that he would have an heir that would sit on that throne of Israel forever. Now, this was not fulfilled in the normal course of Jewish history because the kingdom was broken to north and south and both sides got carted off into captivity by different empires. But, you know, the, the, the biblical narrative goes that it's actually Jesus who fulfills this. So, you've got Abraham, you've got Moses, and you've got David. David. Fast forward again to 740 BC and we have the prophet Isaiah. And he's seeing the thing that everything's starting to unravel. And he you know, predicts the downfall of the Southern Kingdom, the, the only bit that was left. And he also predicts, um, again, 700 years before the fact, a lot of the circumstances of Jesus' birth, of his death, and but also of his the sort of second time that he comes. So this you know, he gives us a lot more detail about what this Messiah is like, what his reign will be like, and kind of why it's good news. So it's first time we get concepts like God as shepherd. God as being the comforter, God as being tender. Uh, these are kind of first really seen in Isaiah and then in some of the other kind of minor prophets like um, Haggai and Malachi and Zechariah who are also set uh, in this work. So we have this kind of tapestry of these two things and that's the whole first half of part one. And then there are 400 years of silence. Nothing, nada. No words, nothing happening. 
And then in this kind of backwater town, which happens to have been the birthplace of King David, just has kind of been, had, had been promised, this child was born um, into another nation under oppression. And so the Jews are now under the Roman Empire. So again, oppression, slavery, deliverance, all of this is wrapped up. I've just realized that there's something else that I forgot to talk about, and that's the law. This is quite important. Because that is a kind of broad brush historical context, and hopefully just having that in your mind is useful as you hear some of these concepts play out. Number two, the structure of the Messiah. So you have three big parts. So the first one, as we've been talking about, is really concerned with the prophecies, the promises that are given about who this person would be, and um, what he would do and behave like when he came among us. Number two, the structure of the Messiah. So you have three big parts. So the first one, as we've been talking about, is really concerned with the prophecies, the promises that are given about who this person would be and um, what he would do and behave like when he came among us. Number two, the structure of the Messiah. So you have three big parts. So the first one, as we've been talking about, is really concerned with the prophecies, the promises that are given about who this person would be and um, what he would do and behave like when he came among us. You begin you know, with these two kind of arias by the tenor, sort of talking about preparing the ground, and these are things that John the Baptist quotes uh, about himself as preparing the way for Jesus, Messiah. You know, so th those, those first bits are are, are talking about our need you know, for a savior and about the fact that we can that we live in darkness and that we need to be purified and so that whole first section is really kind of uh, working on those themes and kind of overlapping in between them and weaving in between them all, again all this goes back to this idea that god is holy we are not we need someone to advocate for us uh, someone to be our high priest and uh, to essentially be, be the one who sacrifices on our behalf the next section kind of hinges on the fulfillment of those promises in the person of Christ. So this prano kind of comes in um, really halfway through that first half. And this is the first chunk that we have that's set from the New Testament, and it's from the Gospel of Luke. Luke was, as far as we know, a first century physician whose gospel kind of set out to be a, a very good historical account full of eyewitness statements. And you know, so he's very precise about detail. And you know, so you, you might have heard this episode where, you know, the um, the announcement of Jesus' birth in this little little town, you know, where um, where Mary and Joseph have had to travel because of Roman census, uh, is the place where where King David came from. So it all comes full circle in this small town of Bethlehem. So the king is born, and he kind of grows up in this little town. And then when Jesus starts his sort of public ministry for these little three years before he dies at the hands of the Romans, Handel and the libretto are sort of weaving together the scriptures to sort of show us that he is this promised shepherd. And you know, Jesus uses those terms about himself, you know, and also just like showing that he is, again, this, this wise, this just king, the one who rules well, who's very shrewd, who understands the way you know, men's minds work, um, and knows how to kind of move among them, but yet not be corrupted by the way that, that, that humans tend to do things. One of the other things that Jesus says about himself is that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so all these, these ideas, again, of being, being the shepherd, the, the, the perfect teacher, the wise ruler, so all kind of, again, fulfilling these promises that were made back in that time. Part two, this is all concerned with the death of Jesus because this is actually, in many ways, the focal point of the entire work. So you remember that Passover incident where they had killed a lamb and put the, the blood above the doorposts? Well, Jesus is actually claiming to be this lamb. He's saying, I am the sacrifice. And in the passage, which it tends to be used, what's called the Eucharist, on um, the Lord's Supper, he sort of says, this is my body broken for you. Like it's a new covenant in my blood. It's a very, very kind of self-conscious claiming of that mantle. Handel's kind of woven together pieces that are looking very, very precisely at this idea of substitution of Christ suffering on our behalf and being separated from God so that we don't have to be. In songs like, uh, by his stripes we are healed, 
or surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And all this stuff is from Isaiah, kind of recognizing that it's one person who actually steps in the gap for us. Uh, and then is eventually cut off from the living and cut off from God himself, ultimately in a way that none of us has been. Then, partway through part two, there is a hinge. But he did not allow you know, his holy one to see corruption. So Jesus dies at the hands of the Romans, he is buried, but God doesn't allow him to stay dead. So he vindicates him, you know, looks and says, yes, I accept what you have done, except this as, you know, as the sacrifice on behalf of humanity. And he raises him from the dead. Uh, this is later kind of called the first fruits from the dead. Then we hinge into the second part of part two, which is very much talking about what happens in the world and in history when this person, the Messiah, is raised from the dead. So the word goes out and, you know, society is transformed and there's you know, that kind of beautiful but strange little song, you know, how beautiful are the feet of him, so of, of them that, that bring good news. But again, it's this idea that you are suddenly right with God, this Messiah has come, paid the thing you couldn't, you know, so that it's actually, it's a release, it's, it is profoundly good news. But then it's also ending, you know, with, with some sections saying, well, because I like to think of it, don't mess with the Messiah. Uh, because he's going to win. So pieces like, why do the nations and thou shalt break them? Sort of saying that, you know, kind of, so oftentimes like George Bernard Shaw sort of says, well, I'd like to save myself, thank you very much. Uh, but if we put ourselves up against this Messiah who also happens to be God, you know, he's kind of omnipotent and, uh, and um, omniscient, then things don't go well for us. And so the idea of like being broken like a potter's vessel and that was just the futility of it. Like, what, why do they rage? against his anointed because it's just not going to work. So that ends with a very famous hallelujah chorus whose text is actually uh, drawn from the book of Revelation which is the one that ends the Bible. So this is when the kind of book ends Genesis that sort of talks about the ultimate reconciliation of humanity with God and kind of the ultimate homecoming where you know if, if Eden begins our exile which continued you know through through the experience of the Jewish people in the wilderness we finally come home. Part number three this is about how we live in the meantime. You know, so Christians would say, or they would believe that Christ has come once, that he will come again, you know, to judge the living and the dead, as the creed says, so that all people will be, you know, raised um, from, the, from, from death and stand account before God. That's, that is the Christian kind of meta-narrative. And so these, these sections are sort of saying, well, how, how does the resurrection actually change things? There's a phrase of C.S. Lewis's that I love, actually from the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the language in the wardrobe, and he talks about death working backwards. So it begins with you know, that beautiful piece, I know that my, my redeemer liveth. And this is actually taken from a very old Old Testament book called Job, about someone who suffers awful things. So in the middle of having lost everything and being totally sort of rock bottom, he says, you know, I know that my Redeemer lives and that I shall, you know, see him on, you know, on the earth. But the worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And so this profound statement of saying, my, my experience might not match what I know to be true yet, but I'm still going to believe it. And so then you have these other pieces that are kind of unpicking, well, what actually is this inheritance that we have? And so then there's that chorus, you know, since by man came death. So if you have Adam, you know, who's the first one to kind of rebel against God um, and death enters, you know, through his disobedience, well, Christ is the one who's, who's obedient to God. So life comes through him. So again, it's the bookend, it's the antidote, if you will, to the poison of the fall. Uh, so that's kind of what that chorus is expressing. Then also sort of talking about bodily resurrection, you know, the trumpet shall sound. And so this, this biblical idea that we will be changed and so just as the bible would say that jesus's body was different after his resurrection in ways that we can't quite define but it just it operated a little bit differently ours will be too not least because they won't rot anymore and our souls as well will not be corrupted we won't be subject to the same operations of sin uh, in the kind of eternal part of our being so that is kind of what that is uh, exploring finally it's just like a big hymn of praise that says, oh my goodness, you know, 
God has accomplished all these things. You know, I, I start with a very um, intimate uh, aria, you know, if God before us, sort of saying, we live in the middle where it's what, what some, is sometimes called the already and the not yet, where it's still a mess, where we still try and fail and we just get things wrong a lot. But the Messiah is also the priest who kind of steps in and advocates and who stands before God and says, you know, I died, I died for that person. And you know, is always there to, as the biblical term would be, intercede for us to take our part, to be an advocate, like in a court. And it's just this beautiful, you know, piece, very, uh, very tender, uh, with single strings, I think, in the way that we're going to do it. And it, it's just, it's an amazing thing, again, that this great, powerful God would actually take the time to do that for us and people who turned turned back on him and it's it's to me in some ways one of the, the the beating hearts of this piece but then we end in the great hymn of praise worthy is the lamb who was slain you know to receive glory glory and honor and wisdom and power and there's that lamb again christ is the lamb and so this is an image that gets used again in in that book revelation you know, Christ is the Lamb who's now living. And it's actually kind of the traditional symbol of the Gospel of John. I was fortunate enough to do a staged version of the Messiah with the Mariapa Company. It's just wonderful. If you ever have the chance to see it, I totally recommend it. You will never experience a piece the same way. And there's a lot of choreography uh, that we did throughout the show in different segments. And in Worthy is the Lamb and the Amen, we were encouraged, especially in the Amen, to essentially just go through particular motions which all kind of had significance of the, the the journey that we were going through that would take us through the arc of all that we had experienced in that show you know, again as we interacted with this narrative so i would encourage you as you sit with that last piece to just let it be the same for you to just as you know, as you hear the different lines going just think of all the different things that have been passing through your head you know all these different ideas and um all these different images that are brought up for us in this incredible, incredible work. Finally, some things to listen for in terms of style. So Handel is a Baroque composer, so there are some conventions that sort of come with that. One of them is this use of dotted rhythms, and so that's the kind of chum, pa-pum, 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 pa-pum. And Handel uses this to great effect. So you, know, you find it you know, in parts of you know, the opening, and then it's, it tends to kind of give a lot of gravitas and intensity to whatever is happening. So you might say, um, in the trumpet shall, shall sound, it's sort of triumphant. Whereas in, in part two, you know, all those that see him laugh him to scorn, it's like, it's very, um, very brutal, almost. And, and then in other places, it's very sort of gentle. You know, um, it's it's almost like a dance, and so it's just thinking: how does he use the you know this this simple figure in many many different ways? So just kind of listen out for that. It's like jump, pa pam, jump, pa pam, pa pam, pa pam. So very simple tool, but very very versatile. One of the other things that Handel uses amazingly well is what you might call accidentals. So if normally music works where it has a home note and everything is kind of related to that home note. Uh, sometimes he'll throw your curveball and take a note that doesn't usually belong in that key or he'll tweak your note up or down and it has this incredible emotional impact but this is also kind of wedded to another aspect it's very typical of Baroque music which is what you might call a b a form and so you have a section of material that's in one key and then you'll have a second section that is oftentimes going into a different key so from major to minor and the whole feeling of it might change and then you go back to the A section. But the second time you infuse it with a different spirit and you add ornaments. So in that middle section, you, you know, would oftentimes go into major and minor. So pieces like Rejoice Greatly that I sing are a great example of this. And so just listen for kind of the way that those three elements of, of the structure um, hold together. But in that last section, that's when you get the twiddlies, different little kind of bells and whistles, or and but sometimes they're they're quite delicate. You know, if if things like, you know, he he was despised, it's it's a very 
specific and delicate sentiment. So one of my favorite ornaments to listen out for is what's called an appoggiatura. And this is an Italian term literally meaning a leaning. So instead of saying, um, ba -dum -ba -dum, if you're coming to the end of a phrase, you would say, ba -dum -di -di. so you get a little clash with whatever's happening underneath before it resolves. And it's just this delicious thing. So in pieces like, he was despised, he was despised, rejected, we get this a lot. Handel is wonderful at, you know, putting, writing these into the text, but also this is part of what singers do for fun, is to kind of put them in. And people actually used to, in, used to in Handel's day, come to hear what singers would do with this return to the A section, because it was a real kind of license for creativity and you could, you could have a lot of fun with it. So those are just some basic things to listen for as you interact with the Messiah. So it can be sort of two and a half to th three hour work. I've done it in what, you know, some 20, 20 half minutes. Hope that it's given you just a little bit of a sense of the overall background, three parts, the Messiah who's promised how that's fulfilled in his life, how that's fulfilled in his death, the big what, you know, what now, between now and that kind of final fulfilling of those promises. Uh, but I think the thing that I just find absolutely evergreen about this work is the, the vividness of Handel's emotional response. Apparently he, well, as legend has it, wrote it in a kind of a bit of a white hot surge of creativity in about two weeks and someone came in as he was finishing the last bit and he was just in absolute tears. And just the, the, the strength of the impression and uh, Stormzy apparently recently sort of said, well, no one can encounter Jesus Christ and not be changed. I would be really, really interested to kind of hear it, if this video has changed you know, the way that you hear it, even if it's a piece that you know really well, or if it's a piece that you haven't heard at all, to sort of think about this amazing, again, tapestry that, that goes all the way from the beginning to the end of history and, you know, and weaves all the way through kind of these elements of human experience and its themes of slavery and deliverance and the idea of someone stepping in you know, on our behalf to save us, to redeem us, literally to buy us back. It's just, it weaves such a compelling picture of this person who is the Messiah. And you know, even people who, who have no faith position whatsoever still again come back and back and back and back to interact with this work. So I would love to hear uh, what your next experience is. So please do leave a comment and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.